the slides. Yeah. Oh, to launch it. my announcements and then so yeah yeah so I'm gonna start making announcements and then tell me the So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, uh, coming to the luncheon rather than uh, wandering around Santa Fe or uh, environs. The, um, I, I have a couple of announcements to make before I introduce Mark Mazer, our luncheon speaker. Um, one is I would like to thank, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors, uh, who are listed on the back of the program, uh, with one exception, and that is um, the New Mexico Tax Research Institute, who uh, made their contributions a little late, but they contributed to last night's reception. But the others, let me run through them quickly. The School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, Vanguard, uh, Center for Business and Economic Research, uh, University of uh, Utah, uh, the Andrew Young School at Georgia State, uh, MIT and TIA Craft, both of them, as well as Peter Muskowski, uh contributed to the um, reception, which is this, this evening in the hotel in honor of uh, Jim Paterba, our Holland Award winner this year. Uh, one, one other announcement is you should have received uh, an email with a link to the presentations that are being made. Um, you all can access all the presentations that have been posted on a public website. Uh, if, if you <coughs> didn't get that announcement or forgotten, if you Google Conference Maker and go to this conference and on the front page, you know, and go to the page, you'll, you'll find that link. And I'd ask participants, if you haven't posted your presentations, please, please do that. So let me turn now to uh, introducing our luncheon speaker. So, <clears throat> so Mark J. Mazur um, was confirmed by the Senate in August 2012 as the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the U.S. Department of Treasury. And he reminded me that he is the longest serving non-attorney Assistant Secretary uh, 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 for Tax Policy in the history of that position. Prior to confirmation, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Analysis in the Office of Tax Policy. He was formerly Director of Research Analysis <coughs> in statistics at the Internal Revenue Service, and has served in various positions throughout government, including stints at the Joint Committee on Taxation, the Council of Economic Advisors, <clears throat> the National Economic Council, and the Department of Energy. Prior to entering public service, Mark was an assistant professor at the School of Urban and Public Affairs, which is now the Heinz School at Carnegie Mellon. He is a PhD and master's degree in uh, a PhD in business and a master's in economics from Stanford and a BA in financial administration from Michigan State University. So without further ado, Mark Mazur. Um, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to be here today, and especially Jim Nunn for, for inviting me here. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be, to be speaking here before all of you, and 
While standing here today, I'm reminded of um, various times I participated in the NTA research um, conference in, in the past. I've been a moderator, a discussant, a presenter, a session organizer. Um, I've even had my paper placed in the 8.30 a.m. Saturday <laughs> sessions. Um, <laughs> And really, there's like a dozen people there. They're bleary-eyed. Most of them are your friends. Um, it's a whole lot better being here uh, in front of all of you today. So I do appreciate that. And I want to thank all of you for attending and participating in this conference. I mean, the NTA does an incredibly good job of bringing together theoretical economists, empirical economists, uh, accountants, lawyers, a whole range of people who are interested in doing tax policy brings them together here to share ideas, share best practices, advance the work that's done in tax policy and tax administration at the federal, state, and local level. It's a huge accomplishment and, and a huge benefit to the, to the nation as a whole. So I thank you all for being here. Um, the topic I want to cover today is tax reform. Um, I'm calling this, this talk um, my views on, on business tax reform. What I want to do is focus on, on taxation of business um, in business incomes. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, review of some of the problems of the business tax system. It'll be a, a review for, for most of you. Then I want to cover a couple of the um, approaches to tax reform that are being discussed among policymakers. I'll do a little bit of compare and contrast with those. And I'll finish up with some thoughts on the prospects for actually making progress on business tax reform. So let's review some of the characteristics of business taxes. Okay. So first I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, statutory tax rates um, for, for corporate taxes. As you probably know, throughout most of the post-World War II period, uh, and into the early 1980s, the United States, most of the rest of the world, had fairly, relatively high corporate income tax rates. It wasn't uncommon to see rates in 40, 50 percent range um, throughout the world. In fact, when the Reagan tax cuts were enacted in 1981, the emphasis was on reducing um, depreciation, or increasing depreciation and expensing, and, um, and uh, investment in, uh, tax credit rather than, than reducing rates. And it wasn't until 1986, Tax Reform Act, that the corporate tax rate was, was reduced in, in steps. And the, the rate went from 46% down to 34%. And the chart there shows the US became a relatively low tax country in the world at that point. Um, in the late 1980s, uh, most of the rest of the world began to reduce their corporate taxes in, in steps. And the U.S. no longer looked like a, like a low-tax country. Um, as you see in the, the chart, as you kind of move in through the 1990s and into 2000s, now the U.S. is a high-tax outlier compared to, to other countries. Um, so the U.S. is a bit, a bit out of step. If you kind of look at statutory tax rates, the headline tax rate that um, is uh, most often focused on, we see that the United States is at the uh, high end of the, the distribution. Um, this is OEC data for, for 2014. It combines federal tax rates with uh, estimate of average state and local taxes. Um, Japan recently cut their rates, so the U.S. is um, by itself on the, on the high end of the um, corporate taxes for the entire OECD. But this is just the maximum, um, maximum statutory tax rate. If we look at effective marginal tax rates, this is for a marginal investment financed with a mix of debt and equity. We get a somewhat different picture. And the US um, situation is somewhat in the middle of the, the G7 countries. And this positioning reflects a relatively high tax rate, but relatively generous accelerated depreciation rules and the effects of a domestic production activities deduction and a tax treatment of debt. So all those things which narrow the tax base reduce the, the effective tax rate. But this calculation does point out the difference between focus on the statutory tax rate and the taxes actually paid on average on, on business tax income. Um, we can look at effective tax rates or average tax rates by industry. We see that they, change, they um, cover quite a wide range in the, in the United States. Um, at the high end of the, the range, we have construction, finance, wholesale, retail. Um, these are industries that tend not to have a lot of special tax provisions associated with them. At the low end of the range, we have um, mining, computers, electronics, transportation, warehousing, um, where there are some, some special provisions there. Um, if economic 
decisions are being driven by this disparate tax treatment, we'd expect to see investment flows move toward the more lightly tax sectors. Um, one of the goals of business tax reform then would be to try and reduce this disparity somewhat and have a more equal set of, of taxes. Similarly, if we look at debt and equity, we see that in the United States, investments financed by, by equity tend to have much higher uh, effective tax rates associated with them than investments financed by, by debt. And again, if you're looking at doing tax reform, you might want to try and reduce this disparity as well. Um, if we look at marginal tax rates for corporate and non-corporate businesses, we see that capital investments made in the corporate sector tend to face a slightly higher effective marginal tax rate than those in the, in the non-corporate sector. Um, obviously, non-corporate investments don't bear an entity-level tax. Um, some refer to the, the taxation of corporations as a double, uh, double set of tax, a double level of tax. Really, the number of times that's taxed is not as important as the total burden. But even here, it shows that um, the, the burden on, on investments in the corporate sector somewhat higher than the tax burden on investments in non-corporate sector. And again, if you were looking to do comprehensive business tax, we try to reduce these differentials somewhat. Um, since the Tax Reform Act of 1986, the share of business tax receipts subject to the corporate income tax has, has declined. And this chart shows, shows a, a fairly dramatic decline over, over time. A number of factors affecting this, some tax, some non-tax. On the tax side, Reduced individual income tax rates um, in the post-1986 world made it more attractive to um, set up non-corporate uh, non entities. Number of uh, restrictions on subchapter S corporations have been loosened over the time, making subchapter S corporations more attractive. Um, investors have become more comfortable investing in large partnerships, those with thousands of partners, and again, that's made, made it more attractive for a non-corporate um, non business. And then states have adopted a number of rules with limited liability corporations that have made it easier to set up an uh, organization that has limited liability as a traditional corporation but is taxed as a, as a partnership. And so all these things have contributed to a shift of um, income from the corporate sector to the, to the non-corporate sector. Um, right now the corporate income tax is responsible for a modest share of federal revenues, somewhere a bit above 10% of federal revenues on the order of 2 to 3% of, of GDP. Um, this chart just looks uh, a little bit at effective marginal tax rates by asset types and um, I think one of the takeaways here is the taxes on intangibles relatively low um, in the United States. Largely this reflects the fact that um, many of the investments in these assets are expensed. In addition, we have additional tax benefits layered on top like an r and &E tax credit and, and some others. Um, Equipment sort of in the middle of the, the pack, land and inventories at the, at the higher end of the, of the spectrum. But again, if you were doing um, business tax reform, you may want to try to reduce some of these disparities, except in cases where there are important spillover, spillover benefits. Um, some other issues with the corporate income tax, um, one that, that comes to mind is the, under the U.S. tax system, there's a large incentive to report income earned by U.S. multinational firms in very low tax jurisdictions. One uh, um, takeaway that uh, Jason Furman at the Council of Economic Advisors likes to point to is that there are a number of island nations, like Cayman Islands, Bahamas, where it looks like the amount of income earned by U.S. multinational firms exceeds the GDP of those, those um, entities, meaning that there seems to be some income shifting going on that's not reflected by the, by the underlying economics. Um, and in response uh, to this income student, you also see effective, uh, effective rates of return being very high in some, um, some countries. And so Ireland is an example where if you look at the rates of return on investments in U.S. multinationals, it's relatively high compared to rates of return around the rest of the world. Um, Marty Sullivan at TextNotes has referred to this as just one more example of the luck of the Irish. Um, let's see. Um, Some of the income shifting is driven by a desire to lower um, cash tax payments, but there's an additional component that, that comes into play here as well. A large part of the, the shifting is driven by U.S. financial accounting treatment. Um, under the U.S. Um, um, generally accepted accounting principles, if companies can, can claim that they have permanently reinvested their earnings abroad, they're no longer subject to the 35% statutory tax rate. 
but subject to a lower tax rate uh, abroad. And that's led to an incentive for a number of U.S. multinationals to claim that they have permanently reinvested their earnings in some other jurisdiction. Um, one counterexample is when we did a repatriation holiday in 2004, when the uh, administration enacted that, or when it was enacted by Congress, um, a number of those permanently reinvested earnings were re unpermanently un invested back into the into the U.S. So um, there may be a little bit of games playing going on going on there as well. And that brings me to one more example of uh, uh, another symptom of a corporate tax system that's not working very well, and this is the public push this year by a number of U.S. multinational firms to undertake what are called corporate inversions. Um, so a corporate inversion occurs when a U.S. multinational firm purchases or, or merges with a um, foreign um, firm and adopts a foreign domicile for tax purposes. So my cartoon example, it's a big U.S. multinational firm, a small, relatively small foreign firm, mergers set up, the um, combined firm now takes a foreign address and, and tries to reduce their um, tax payments by shifting future earnings of the U.S. Um, future earnings of the, of the combined combination out of the U.S. tax system, and potentially to find other ways to reduce um, um, uh, the size of the U.S. corporate tax base. There are a couple dozen publicly proposed uh, corporate inversions, and many more were in the pipeline when Treasury announced guidance in, in late September on, on this topic. The goal of the guidance was to reduce the tax incentives to undertake these, um, these mergers and provide some time for, for Congress to, to act on, on the subject. Um, so far, it's a little bit of a timeout. We'll see if Congress takes up that, that opportunity to, to act. So those are some of the problems with the um, business tax system. And now an appropriate um, way to address it would be to, to undertake um, business tax reform. So up on the... the um, Slide uh, up on the screen is a cover of the President's Framework for Business Tax Reform. In February 2012, the President uh, released this framework. Three things you, you should take away from this. One, it's the President's Framework on Tax Reform. The President, President Obama was uh, personally involved in a number of the decisions made on this, and he really does have ownership of it. He's talked about this State of the Union address, talked about it in a number of speeches. He really does, does uh, um, support the, the Framework for business, business Tax Reform much different than if it was just a treasury white paper that we had put out on, on our own. Second, it's a framework, and that was intentional. The idea was not to nail down every detail of a, of a tax reform plan, but to provide a range of um, options where you could have a, a discussion about particular parts of this with stakeholders, um, congressional members and staffs, business leaders, academics, and, and so on. And, and third, third takeaway is it focuses on business tax reform. So it's not just corporate tax reform because if you're talking about the corporate tax base, you necessarily need to talk about the uh, taxes paid by non-corporate businesses. And you, and you want to make conscious choices here on how you're going to be treating entities in business tax reform vis-a-vis -vis, uh, corporate and non-corporate business. Um, so the President's framework enunciated several important principles. One, um, business tax reform should improve the climate for creation and retention of high quality jobs in, in the United States. We all know that tax reform is a big political lift, um, that political capital should be invested in this activity only if you're going to get some kind of a, of a, of a benefit from, from doing so. Um, second, um, business tax reform should be revenue neutral in, in the long run. Um, this means about the same proportion of revenue raised under reform as would be raised without it. And it's also in future decades, as well as the current conventional 10-year budget window. And it's important, if you think about the fiscal challenges that the nation's facing in the long run, you probably don't want to be making them worse through business tax reform. And so that was a, an important, important component here. Um, third, the framework would broaden the tax base in, in a number of ways and reduce the, the corporate tax rate to around 28%, which puts it in within shouting distance of, of our trading partners. The framework would uh, strengthen international tax rules, um, would reduce the incentive or the ability of firms to use tax engineering to shift profits from one uh, jurisdiction to another, from the U.S. to, to some foreign jurisdiction. Um, and also would reduce the incentive to um, shift uh, real, real investments abroad. The framework would provide important and permanent tax benefits for activities that had important spillover benefits. The poster child here 
would be the R&D tax credit, where we think that there are important benefits to undertaking research, not captured by the firm that does it. It's important to provide a public subsidy for that to encourage that, that activity. Um, the framework also would seek to simplify the tax code where possible. Having uh, provisions made permanent makes decision making um, easier um, and reduce uncertainty. And tax compliance could be improved by taking steps like increasing thresholds for cash accounting and so on. So smaller businesses would have a simpler um, compliance um, situation. And finally, the framework would not raise taxes on small business. Um, this is probably not an economic uh, um, a provision, more as a political uh, recognition that probably not possible to get business tax reform enacted into law if what happens is you're cutting taxes on large businesses and raising them on small businesses. Um, so this framework was elaborated on a lot by, by the administration in budget proposals in fiscal year 2014, 2015. The budget has a special um, section that's titled Reserve for Business Tax Reform. That contains illustrative examples of policies that you'd want to have um, in part of any, any tax reform. And the president recognized that when you undertake business tax reform that's revenue neutral in the long run, you're likely going to be raising revenue in the short run because you'd have a number of timing shifts and so on that will generate revenue in, the, say, the first 10 years of, of the budget window. And one of the um, observations was, well, when we've done tax reform in the past, 86 tax act and, and so on, um, there have always been transition rules. And so having this revenue in place allows you to do transition rules. What the president observed is that well, you can scrape off some of this revenue, maybe $100 billion over the budget window, $150 billion, and invest it in infrastructure. And this is one of the points that, that Joe Stiglitz made yesterday, is that this is a kind of investment that helps the economy in the short run, helps the economy in the long run, just a very positive investment. And frankly, from a business standpoint, helps businesses because it makes it easier to do the logistics, transportation, and so on that they need to, uh, to undertake their business. So uh, um, this was the, um, basically the, the, the president's framework. So what are the, the benefits of, of business tax reform? I think you can view the benefits as real and significant, but probably not overwhelmingly large from an economics, uh, economic perspective. You get a slightly better allocation of capital. Um, investments uh, between, uh, investment choice between activities would be made um, somewhat more um, optimal if you reduce the tax differentials. You get slightly less emphasis on debt, which would um, reduce the amount of leverage in the, in the overall economy, could help with overall um, economic or financial stability. Greater certainty about tax rules would help firms make better decisions. They wouldn't um, be subject to trying to guess what the tax rules are going to be like for, for long-lived investments. Updated international tax rules could help um, take some of the tax aspects out of cross-border investment, also could help reduce uh, a race to the bottom among, among countries. And somewhat lower compliance costs could help the economy as a whole as you re, um, redeploy those resources somewhere else. I like to think that if we had more um, real engineers and fewer tax engineers, the world would be better off. And this would be an example of how you can make that, make that happen. Um, but importantly, we shouldn't expect revenue neutral business tax reform to have huge macroeconomic effects. And so one of the things that we sometimes hear is, well, if we did a revenue estimate that was dynamically, a dynamic uh, scoring, we'd get these big benefits. That's probably not going to happen in the case of, of revenue neutral reform. And so you want to kind of temper expectations a little bit in that, in that regard. Um, so now we can compare the president's framework to some of the other tax reform proposals that have been been advanced. And I think you'll see there's a surprisingly large amount of overlap. Um, I think the overlap is probably at least two-thirds between President's framework, Chairman Camp's proposals, and, and the ones from um, um, Chairman Bacchus. So take Chairman Camp's proposals first in the Ways and Means Committee. His plan broadens the tax base a lot, um, shares many aspects of the President's framework in, in doing so. Um, in fact, we um, in the administration took a number of proposals that were laid out in Chairman Camp's um, plan and incorporated into the President's budget because they either were exactly the same as what we had in our plan or they were really close and they seemed like they were improvements on things that we had been thinking about. Chairman Camp's proposal would take the current corporate tax rate at 35% and reduce it in steps to, to 25%. His plan is revenue neutral in the budget window 
Um, but because it uses one-time revenue and, and some timing gimmicks and has the tax rate stepping down, it loses significant amounts of revenue outside the budget window. And so it would be a long-term tax cut for, for corporations. Um, President, uh, sorry, Chairman Camp's plan, he wished he was President Camp, but um, <laughs> Chairman Camp's plan um, moved to a hybrid form of taxation at the um, international sphere. Um, it was between a traditional worldwide and, and a, a traditional territorial approach, though perhaps best described as a, a modified territorial um, system. And his proposal also strengthened a number of the, the uh, international tax rules, much like the, the President's framework. Um, Chairman Camp's Chairman Camp's proposal also um, modified a number of areas of business tax taxation, not in the in the corporate sector, recognizing that there is a linkage between um, corporate uh, tax reform and, and the individual side of the of, of the ledger. Um, Chairman Bacchus he uh, put out a series of option papers on tax reform, without necessarily favoring particular options, but these papers did lead to to some important observations. One. He'd also moved to some hybrid form between a territorial system and a, and a, a worldwide system. Um, he'd also strengthen international tax rules to prevent inappropriate income shifting. Um, but he also had some, some innovative um, proposals in there for modifying the, the research credit, for changing the way we do depreciation, and so on, that would certainly, you'd certainly want to consider as part of any, any um, tax reform plan. And a third contributor to the thinking in business tax reform is the work that's done by the OECD in their base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS activities. And, and this work is being conducted by teams of international tax experts. It's really aimed at, at um, cross-border transaction, and it address, addresses some particularly tricky areas of, of international tax. One area that, it tries to, that the BEPS project tries to address is stateless income. Ed Kleinbard's been a, a, a keen observer of the fact that some multinational firms are able to shift um, income between jurisdictions to places where it's taxed nowhere. Um, if you're an international tax administrator, you think that's a bad, a bad situation. Um, the OECD is also looking at hybrid securities and hybrid entities. These are securities that are treated as debt in one jurisdiction and equity somewhere else. Again, that's a, a form of tax arbitrage that you really don't want to have in a, in a tax system. And importantly, the OECD project's dealing with the digital economy. And, and this is one where it's really hard to figure out what the right answer is and in, in where income is being earned. If you think about a transaction that um, generates um, the economy through the, through the internet, either by downloading music or um, software or even just be serving up ads on a search service, there's a number of parts of that transaction that take place in a number of different countries, really hard to figure out how much of that, those slivers of income are earned in each of those jurisdictions. And the BEPS project also is working on increasing the transparency of uh, tax reporting so that tax administrators around the world can um, compare notes and, and do a better job of improving tax compliance. So all these efforts address um, international tax issues and should be considered part of a, of a reform of the, the US tax system. Some of these concepts in the BEPS process process were proposed by Treasury. Some have re received additional con consideration in the context of preparing budget proposals. But all these are being worked on with the goal of being ready for prime time in the next year or so. And a number of these probably should wind up in a business tax reform plan. So that brings us to the prospects for business tax reform. And I think as I've laid out, there's a lot of commonality in the tax reform proposals. Um, I've said that they may overlap by, by two thirds or more. So ordinarily, this would bode well for the prospects of business tax reform. Moreover, Chairman Camp um, in the Ways and Means Committee and Chairman Bacchus and Chairman Wyden in the Senate Finance Committee have done a lot of the foundational work needed to advance tax reform. Their members are smarter, their staffs are smarter, they understand the trade-offs better, they understand the benefits that they are likely to get from undertaking reform. That foundational work is, is all a necessary condition for moving things further, but, but obviously not a, not a sufficient condition. The next... Um, stage is to sort of build momentum for business tax reform. And this is going to involve interested stakeholders motivating the public on a desirability of legislation in, in this area. The administration will, will do its part. I think the president's been out speaking on this a lot. Uh, but it's largely up to the business community to make this a top tier issue for the American public. And on this topic, I'm reminded of an observation by, by Bill Gale, who has noted that the biggest obstacle for business tax reform has been the business community itself. And so really, unless that changes, you're not going to see this this uh, um, 
enacted into law in, in the near future. On the political side of things, to date, the politics have not been favorable for, for business tax reform. Um, that has the possibility to, to change in 2015. Um, an optimist would look at what several senators and House members have said they've laid out plans for governing in uh, the coming year. And they often mention tax reform, trade, terrorism as things that they could, they could imagine um, working with the administration on. So maybe there's progress that, that can be made in, in this area. So I guess tax reform is, is potentially on the, the to-do list. And it's likely the next couple of months are gonna give us some indication of to, as to whether it's really, truly on a to-do list or, or, or not. And one of the um, things that's gonna to have to happen in the next few months in order to enact tax reform is that a lot of progress is gonna to have to be made by the middle of 2015. After that point, you'll be in a situation where politically just not possible to, to address something this big in an election year. So we'll get a lot of signals in the next couple of months whether that's gonna happen or not. One of these opportunities is gonna be how Congress handles the expiring provisions. There are a number of provisions in the tax law that expire routinely, about 55 or so of them. Many of these have expired already. In fact, they expired at the end of, of 2013, nearly a year ago. If Congress can address the fate of these provisions in a, a bipartisan way with minimum of, of drama, that would be a good sign. It would be bode, bode well for, for progress on business tax reform. On the other hand, as an economist, I have to say that at least once each speech, um, if Congress cannot address these provisions this year and the IRS has a chaotic filing season and there's a lot of blame being tossed around, that's gonna be a bad signal for the prospect of business tax reform because frankly, business tax reform is like an order of magnitude harder to enact than doing, dealing with the expiring provisions. So the coming weeks of the lame duck session in Congress gonna provide us with a good opportunity uh, whether we should be cautiously optimistic about the prospects uh, of business tax reform, and cautiously optimistic might be 10 or 15% chance of enactment, or think about um, muddling along the current suboptimal system of, of tax reform for the next, next few years. Um, I want to thank you all for your attention today, and I look forward to addressing your questions and comments. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, once again, I would ask that if you have a question, come to, the, to one of the mics uh, and state your name and try to keep your question short. Thanks. I'm Bob Williams of the Tax Policy Center. You said you included small business in the larger question of business reform. Can you then not also have to require the com combination of individual tax reform and business tax reform, because the same kind of combination fits, doesn't it? Um, good, good question. The, the um, way, way I look at this is that you need to address um, income earned through, through businesses in a comprehensive way in order to deal with business tax reform. And the question is, does it have to leak over to the rest of the individual income tax? Um, I think that's probably does not have to happen. Um, obviously, it would be good if we took the 86 model and said, okay, we do the entire um, tax system. But the 86 model effectively was a shift of tax, tax burden from um, individuals to businesses, and really not so much to businesses because it's largely timing shifts. Um, but we probably can't do that now given the, the fiscal realities that we have. And so if you're thinking of combining the two, effectively you're saying, well, we're probably going to be raising revenue in the long run somehow, um, and be very explicitly raising them from individual taxpayers. It seems like that just raises the degree of difficulty a lot in enacting tax reform. Questions, comments? Hi, I'm Brian Galley. Mark, what, what would you say to a critic who says that in the revenue neutral component of this package that the administration has once again bargained with itself and that revenue neutrality, if this critic were being tendentious, is another kind of tax holiday because after all the current amount of money that we draw from the business community is the product of a couple of decades of, in some cases, very aggressive tax avoidance and so we're essentially rewarding that community for its efforts by locking in the current level of revenue. Yeah, I think that um, when the administration came out with the framework for, for business tax reform, the feeling was that um, you were acknowledging that 
uh, corporate taxes would be just a couple percent of GDP for the foreseeable future. And that appears to have been a reality from the 1990s or so on. So it's not like a brand new thing. It's not like going back to the 50s when corporate tax revenues were a much larger fraction of the, of the budget. Um, and I don't think we're, the administration is really bargaining with itself. It really was viewed as a, um, an opportunity to engage uh, Congress on kind of big things. And one of the frustrating parts of, of um, the process here was that the business community didn't immediately come up and say, hey, um, revenue neutral business tax reform, that's a good thing for us. Um, we spent many months dealing with business taxpayers coming in and saying, well, how about a tax cut? Um, and that was not something that really uh, the president could, could see doing. So that was about as far as, as we could go. We thought it was a good, a good starting point. Yes, Len. Len Berman, Tax Policy Center. One of the things that seems to stand in the way of tax reform, admittedly there are about a million, but one is the, this kind of focus on transparency and that every, everybody has to know everything that's going on. And it's easy when you throw out ideas, particularly you know, as, as parts of programs, to for people in your own party or the other party to just beat you over the head with them. Is there any chance that the president and the congressional leaders of both parties could get together in private and talk about, and, and staff, like kind of like the, the Andrews Air Force Base thing, where you basically get behind closed doors, talk about all these things in a setting where you can't, <laughs> you won't get beat up at least immediately, and then maybe talk about a, a package that could represent a reasonable compromise. That's a, Len, that's a um, reasonable approach, a reasonable tactical approach on how to do this. I think. The, the president was engaged in a number of negotiations on big fiscal deals with Speaker Boehner, um, and generally the details did not leak out, so there is a possibility of that kind of thing happening. That's one where I think we're going to spend the next few weeks seeing if there is a, a path forward here. And so when I use the example of expiring provisions as a, a, a test here, it really is a situation where if you can make some progress, in a way without a whole lot of drama uh, on expiring provisions, without a whole lot of beating up on each other, then maybe you can take the next step and, and, and go on to something harder, in some sense like a confidence building exercise. And obviously we're not gonna have the uh, president and speaker like falling backwards into each <laughs> other to see if they have the confidence on that, but this is at least a way you can imagine doing something. Ted Sato, Loyola Marymount. So uh, over the last, I don't know, uh, 10 years, um, there's been a lot of fluctuation back and forth on the expensing rules. Uh, the bonus depreciation, 179 limits have moved all over the place. Much to my surprise, we don't have bonus depreciation now, or at least unless we do it retroactively, and 179 limits have gone way down. Uh, and then Chairman Camp's proposal really drastically cut back on expensing. Could you talk a little bit about the politics of the expensing rules? Sure, so in the case of, of bonus depreciation and expensing, we'll, we'll, I want to talk about those somewhat separately. case of bonus depreciation, largely viewed as a stimulus measure. So when the economy is not doing well, in, set up a, a partial expensing si system for all taxpayers so that they can recover the cost of their capital investments very rapidly. Um, and that was viewed as a, as a stimulus measure. It may have had some um, usefulness in, in that context. I think as the economy gets onto a, a more stable growth path, the argument for, for bonus depreciation tends to, to become much weaker and eventually go away. Um, in the case of, of 179 um, expensing for, for smaller businesses, that really is both uh, a benefit to smaller businesses to encourage them to, to expense thing, uh, to purchase capital and expense it immediately, but also a simplification measure for, for smaller businesses. So don't have to worry about depreciation records and, and so on. Um, so it has like twofold benefits there. And the current uh, law um, level, I think, is $25,000. Um, it has been as high as $500,000 over the last few years. Um, the president's fr framework for business tax reform would be made permanent at a reasonably high level um, in order to provide a permanent incentive for smaller businesses to, to invest and, and have some simplification aspects as well. Now, the politics of that, um, We'll sort of see how this plays out in the case of expiring provisions to how, um, how this works out. I think from the administration's standpoint, uh, we've not had bonus depreciation in our budget. That's sort of a signal that the economy's grown, is on a, a better growth path and probably not, not needed so much in the, 
in subsequent years, for sure, are not to be made permanent. Yeah. Uh, Pat Dreesen. Uh, Mark, uh, can you uh, give the administration's view on the turmoil in the Michigan Athletic Department? <laughs> uh, so as a Michigan State grad, that's probably a, a bad question for me to comment actually, on. Actually, uh, I'm interested <laughs> in some of the things that are being held revenue neutral and harmless. I don't hear much discussion of the cost of capital. If we go back to the 86 Act, of course, mm -hmm. the cost of capital went up, but you got greater uniformity. And if we had had macro models then, I think we would have seen some positive things. And I think some of the studies subsequently showed that. But I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing much. If I'm, a, if I'm a business person and I'm hearing that the cost of capital probably go up, as I think it did in Chairman Camp's proposal, and I'm not hearing a lot about the uniformity uh, results because, as you say, don't expect a lot in the macro. Mm -hmm. Why should I? Why should I buy into this? I think from a business standpoint, why, why a business might want to buy into business tax reform, several fold. One, you reduce the headline rate, so this will help with their reported financial earnings. Um, two, you um, provide a degree of certainty that doesn't exist now by making things like the R&E credit permanent, having the uh, um, rules for cost recovery be made permanent, provides a, a degree of, of uh, certainty that, that uh, businesses say they want. Um, and you provide a little bit of, of simplification, and I think you provide a little bit of um, improved incentives to invest in things that don't necessarily have large tax uh, um, elements associated with them. So you get like somewhat better improvement, in, uh, somewhat better um, workings in the economy. But from a company standpoint, it really does come down to, um, on average, they'll pay about the same amount of tax, some higher, some lower. Do they think that they get enough uh, in terms of permanence, certainty, and so on out of this to, to make it worthwhile. And it may be that's one of the reasons that the business community is not um, latched on to, to business tax reform because once they start doing the calculations, some folks look at that and they perceive themselves as potential losers in there and it helps the coalitions unravel at that point. Go blue. <laughs> yeah, that's so Treasury has moved very quickly in dealing with the issue of inversions, and I'm just wondering, at this point, since there's been some success on that front, uh, would there be any consideration of slowing down additional guidance on uh, inversions and putting that in with overarching tax reform? So uh, corporate inversions, the one thing that um, I think Secretary Lewis made very clear is that First best solution would be to do business tax reform that dealt with the inversion issue along with a multitude of other issues. Second best thing would be for Congress to just enact legislation that was particularly focused on, on inversion activities. Third best, and that's kind of where we ended up, was doing something administratively. Um, the notice that we put out in, in September was um, very well crafted so that it's within the four corners of the, the, the provisions, tax provisions, because um, we want to make sure we're on solid legal footing doing that. We also, though, in the notice made pretty clear that this was a, a first step and asked for comments on a wide range of other, other topics. We're still getting those comments in. We'll be evaluating them. Um, we'll see what steps might be necessary in the, in the future. Obviously, if Congress acts, that would be better. Um, if Congress doesn't act, then we'll have to see what, what options exist. Uh, I have a couple questions. First. Uh, you didn't address directly what was, was being do, done to uh, help create jobs. And this a little bit is at tension with one of the other questions. If you lower the cap cost of capital rather than labor, you use more capital intensive technology rather than more labor intensive technology. So there seems to be a little tension here. The second thing uh, is that uh, yesterday I tried to argue that uh, there ought to be higher taxes on returns to, uh, prof to profits and broader, uh, rather than lower taxes. And uh, you haven't really included that in your principles of business uh, <laughs> reform. Uh, and I just wondered, uh, why not? <laughs> and maybe, and the third question is, there are a whole set of other social objectives and economic yeah. objectives that weren't listed, uh, for instance, and you mentioned them in your talk, and they're not, you know, greater efficiency, you know, less distortion in the t tax system. Uh, uh, you talk about positive spillovers. There are a lot of uh, negative problems, like with pollution, uh, 
why not use uh, increase in tax on pollution as a way of, of uh, raising revenue in a way that increases the efficiency of the, econ uh, of the economy. So there, there are a lot of other social objectives that were not included in the, your, your principles. Uh, so uh, first, part, I, I agree that I didn't include everything that you talked about yesterday in the talk today. <laughs> I apologize for that. <clears throat> it's one of the hazards of following a Nobel Prize winner. Um, <laughs> In the case of, of creating jobs, one of the things that, that we were trying to do there was to set up permanent incentives that made some sense. So things like R&E credit we think has some, a lot of spillover benefits. In the case of taking some of the resources and using it for infrastructure spending, same thing. Jobs created now, better um, economic outcome in the past. There's a large discussion um, within the administration on manufacturing. What types of um, incentives should be put in place for, for manufacturing, again, as a way to to generate jobs or generate support for jobs. This in the context of business reform, there's a whole other agenda on kind of social side of things with education, training, and so on that we hope would be complementary to this. And obviously I didn't talk about that, but there is that whole background there that, that really does, I think, um, work in concert with the plan to do business tax reform um, to, to create jobs. In the, the point you made earlier about, uh, about climate change issues, um, and dealing with uh, externalities there. I mean, that's a, that's a valid point, and um, one that expressed by, by a number of people looking at this. I think right now where the, um, the administration is looking at ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without um, directly setting up a, a tax system, um, I think the feeling is that's beyond the pale of what the political system would, would accept. Um, but in a parallel universe, uh, those ideas may be getting a lot more traction. So. Last question. Jim Hines. I'm the Michigan Athletic Director. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank <you>. Thanks. <laughs> uh, the team will do better next year. So uh, my question is, when we think about business tax reform and you know, uh, the administration's proposals, to what extent should we care about how different our system is than other countries' systems? Some of, the, some of the principles that you've articulated you know, on the slide and also in the reform would push us in the direction of other countries like lowering the statutory rate, for example, but others would take us you know, away from what other countries are doing. Does it matter whether we've got you know, a very different kind of treatment of companies than G7 or OECD countries, or should we just you know, ignore yeah. what the other countries are doing? That's a, that's a, a very good question, something that's always on on the minds of policymakers, and they're looking at this and saying, to what degree is the U.S. exceptional, um, and what degree should we be more like everyone else? And one of the, the, the core observations is, everyone else has a VAT, we don't have a VAT. We're probably not having a VAT in the next couple of years. So part of what you've seen other countries do is raise their value-added tax rates, use as a way to lower their taxes on, on corporations or, or businesses and so on. We don't have that lever, and so it makes it, harder to, to get quite in sync with, uh, with uh, other countries. But what we're trying to do here is to reduce at least some of the um, larger areas of, of, of difference. And part of what I talked about when I, when I mentioned the BEPS project at OECD, part of that is to try and begin the process of getting a little bit closer in terms of tax rules for, for taxing multinational firms. Obviously, you're not going to get all the way there. The US is always going to be somewhat different than other countries that they don't have a bat. Um, but at least move a tiny bit in that direction would be, would be a step, step forward. And uh, good luck with the athletics. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, time here with you.